let me throw in a bit of law into the mix. We have this, we've heard the words, keywords perhaps, depersonalization, automation, autonomization, deception, anonymity, maybe even machine to machine warfare. And if I'm thinking back, because Vincent mentioned it's 150 years since the first Geneva Convention, this whole codification of international humanitarian law that we've witnessed, this trend through the last one and a half centuries, was a response to something. It was the industrialization of warfare, basically the industrial production of, of weapons, of very powerful weapons, the mass armies that started to appear with the Napoleonic Wars and throughout the 19th century of poorly trained soldiers, let's face it, with very powerful weapons, uh, causing a lot of damage uh, and a lot of, of, of suffering, mainly at that time among the armed forces, that the medical services couldn't deal with and so on. So it was a, a response, and the term has been coined that basically humanitarian law, very telling name, the law of armed conflict, humanitarian law, was about the humanization of war. The response to this kind of technical industrialization in the late 19th century. Now we're facing a new trend of new technologies on a very broad scale, invading, so to speak, the, the battle space. Are we facing, are we witnessing a new dehumanization, so to speak, of warfare that requires a new response? Or can the response of the 19th century humanitarian law as we know it, can it respond to this trend? Is it adequate? Can it keep up? Just before getting into the question whether the law is sufficient, I think it's interesting um, where you raised the question whether um, we're, going, we're following a trend about the dehumanization of warfare. Because actually there are some people that claim that thanks to this new technology, um, war will be more humane because I'm not saying I'm sharing as you, but there are some people that claim that technology is there to help the existing, existing conventional armed forces and conventional types of weapons to better implement IHL and, and human rights provisions. And this leads me to another question. I'm also wondering whether we as civilians, and I consider myself a civilian too, now we stand in the picture. <laughs> I'm a Malaysian um, Swiss officer, a volunteer, because I thought that in order to be credible, to talk to my target audience, which is the military, I decided that it was a good idea to enroll, and so I'm in the military justice, so I have like a, um, a small kind of activity within the armed forces. Uh, but I'm wondering whether we civilians have not also contributed to this, because if we look around in Europe, the trend is to reduce the number of the armed forces. In Switzerland, we, we have just had a vote on this referendum. We decided to keep conscri conscription, uh, in other countries like Austria and Germany, they would like to go back to conscription because there's an awareness that with such limited numbers of um, humane personnel available, it's very difficult to face the current threats, the existing risks. Um, I've just flown back from Hungary this morning, and for instance in Hungary there's also concern in this regard because um, conscription has been abolished, and now with the Ukraine and the Crimea situation, there's much concern about the borders not being protected. So in one way we've pushed um, the military to look for alternatives to humane power, and this is where technology comes in. It's like during the Industrial Revolution. At the same time, if I think about the Swiss Armed Forces, it's interesting because we have the notion of citizen soldiers. And we've noticed in the field that when uh, the citizens um, you know, go back to the reservist duty um, on Sunday evening, and then on Monday they see that the radio system is not working, what do they do? They go back to their smartphones. They communicate via WhatsApp. Uh, via emails, and so this intermingling showed that the civilians are used to a certain kind of technology that they also want to use within the military. So, you know, there's a, there's a stronger exchange and um, there are new concerns. So to go back, I think it's, it's also part of a new society that we don't want um, so much loss among human beings. We don't want to see corpses being brought back in, in you know, in coffins. And sometimes it's also easier to see machines fighting something which is as dirty as war. Thank you, Roberta. Laurent, from the ICRC point of view, generally, 
Do you feel that humanitarian law, as you are guarding it, is sufficient as a response to the new technologies that we're likely to face? I think it's important not to underestimate the adaptability of international humanitarian law. Nils, you spoke just before of the fact that it's a 19th century uh, law, I would say at least 20th century for all the main principles. And I think when I say we should not underestimate its adaptability, it's because the foundation of international humanitarian law is general principles which I express precisely in general terms and which can be applied to very different type of warfare. As we were just discussing uh, with uh, the other panelists and, and Bill before, the, um, there is no specific rules on air warfare. Air warfare is regulated by the general principle of IHL, despite the fact that it's present since 100 years. But that shows that general principles are able to uh, regulate uh, uh, new technologies because at the time, a uh, hundred years ago, it was the new technologies. Of course, new technologies must respect existing law. That's the first question, and uh, that's also, also somehow an answer to this question, can the law keep up? The law is here, and it's the technology who have to keep up with the law. If the technology does not comply with the law, the technology is not allowed to be used in armed conflict. Full stop. That's how the law stands, and that's, I think, pretty much undisputed. Uh, so what does it mean to comply with the law? It's with the general principle like the uh, prohibition of superfluous injuries and unnecessary suffering, the obligation of uh, discrimination between civilians and uh, combatants, um, proportionality and precaution, all those basic principles. And when maybe we continue the discussion, we might see a number of challenges uh, with regard to new technology, how they can or they cannot, the challenge they pose to respect those principles. But let's be clear again, if the technology does not master the ability to respect the principle, I mean, if the weapon uh, cannot, uh, when it's used, respect the principle, then it simply cannot be used. Now, of course, and coming back to your last question, uh, whether the law is sufficient, that's always the question that wants has to look at when a new technology is developed, whether the law as it exists is sufficiently clear, sufficiently precise. Does it bring the protection that uh, we want, that the law was supposed to bring to both civilians and combatants? And that's certainly something on which we have to reflect us as the ICRC, but uh, first of all states when they study and develop uh, such technology, uh, whether in view of the specific characteristic of the technology, in view of uh, their foreseeable humanitarian impact, whether the law is sufficient or not. We don't have a general view on whether it's the current law is sufficiently detailed for all new forms of uh, new technology. New technology evolves every day, so uh, any general position we would have would be outdated uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, uh, but certainly, we think, uh, for example, for cyber, that there might be possibly um, at some point a need to reflect on the necessity to uh, um, develop the law that will be for states to do it, but that's, in our view, certainly one of the um, technology which raise most questions, certainly much more than drones, for example, uh, in terms of how to apply existing law to it. That's probably also the case for uh, autonomous weapons, and especially for one aspect, uh, we, because there is the technical aspect whether uh, that you expressed, uh, 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 that you mentioned before, whether through autonomy we will be able, I mean, whether technology will be able to uh, distinguish between uh, combatants and civilians, and between combatants and wounded combatants, and between fighting combatants and uh, combatants who want to surrender. So. That raises a whole lot of questions. If the technology cannot do it, then autonomous weapons cannot be used. That's easy. Now, even if the technology would allow to do that and to respect principle of proportionality, et cetera, et cetera, which is certainly not in the foreseeable future, then remains the ethical or moral question, uh, is it um, appropriate to take the human out of the um, decision to kill somebody? And that's a question that is not answered for the time being, and that uh, on which we, as the ICRC, don't have um, an answer yet either. 
it's, I, I said first, it's an ethical question, but it's also a legal question in the sense that uh, you have in the law uh, th what is called the Martens Clause, which says that for situations which are not regulated by the law, uh, um, the um, civilians and the combatants remain under uh, the protection of the dictates of the public conscience. And this has been also uh, used in the past with regard to uh, new developments. That's certainly something which was uh, referred to in the preamble of the mine land bound convention, uh, also when this, uh, that's not new technology, uh, um, but uh, with uh, also with regard to the debate which led to the prohibition of uh, blinding laser uh, uh, weapons, which have been forbidden. That's the only example of uh, new technology which had been forbidden before being deployed on the battlefield. So that's certainly something which uh, still needs to uh, be discussed and uh, debated. So new technology has to comply with existing law. It's not existing law that has to adapt to the new technology. Uh, Marco, how do you see things? Can the law keep up? You ask the wrong person because I'm the person who always believes, perhaps because of my civil law background, that rules, you know, the Code Napoleon is more or less still the Code Civil today. And uh, the world has totally changed. It is precisely because the rules are general and abstract that new phenomena have to be dealt with under the existing law until we are able to uh, change the law and hopefully in the good direction. Now I'm slightly skeptical whether it's easy to find agreement on new rules, so let us live with the existing rules I think an important basic uh, thing is that uh, only humans are bound by legal rules. If you believe that, then somehow technology is not so important because it's always humans who produce the technology, who decide perhaps two years before it is used how the technology will actually target. Therefore, even the moral question, is it immoral that one, that uh, I find it immoral that a human kills another human, but uh, this is my very personal opinion. But uh, <laughs> is it inhuman that a machine kills a human? Uh, well, there too, we have to be conscious that uh, if we were asking these questions in the Middle Ages or with the samurai in Japan, that would have been a genuine question. Well, I mean, today, yes, it's someone, hopefully, there are always humans who remain in control. Someone on a, a warship in the Indian Ocean sends a, a missile, a tomahawk missile, and he doesn't know the persons who will be killed in Baghdad. Hopefully, he knows that's a military objective, and someone has made the proportionality cal calculation, and then these people are killed, and uh, he doesn't know who these people are. So the idea that us it was ideally, don't believe that it was better in the Middle Ages, please study history, um, that ideally it's a human being who knows the other human being and then kills that, that's simply not IHL as it is today, so I think I fully agree there is a question of technology. We have to know whether the technology is able uh, to respect the rules, but it's not really the technology. Whether the human beings who use the technology by using this technology are able to comply with their obligations under the law, and for instance, for autonomous weapons, we know that this is yet not yet the case, but I could imagine, perhaps, but this is not my problem. That's the problem of the technologists. Perhaps one day it's possible. And uh, the skepticism towards technology, I don't fully share this skepticism, simply look at uh, where are more victims, where's more suffering, where high technology is used or without high technology. Is Syria, is South Sudan, is the Democratic Republic of Congo a problem of 
Too much technology or not enough technology? I think, well, unfortunately, perhaps because of my past, that only humans can be inhuman. And unfortunately, humans do a lot of bad things, but obviously they can also have compassion. Compassion is something behind. The law is not a rule uh, of the law. So we need to know whether the technology is able to comply uh, or the human beings are able to comply with the rules even using this new technology, then there are, and we come certainly back to that, some technical question, technical legal question, like uh, how, I don't know, to evaluate the military advantage. Um, how could, even without technology, it's a question of principle, in my view, for instance, an autonomous weapon could not evaluate, it could evaluate uh, the civilian, uh, r the risk for civilian, but not the military advantage, because the military advantage is constantly developing according to the plans of the commander, according to the situation um, in the hostilities. And the answer is simply this means that there must be an input into the autonomous weapon. Whether this is possible, I don't know. And I agree that cyber is probably the most uh, critical one because it's on a very different level. And there, I think uh, we can deal with most uh, of the problems under the existing law, while there are some issues where either the law is over-inclusive or under-inclusive. So, for instance, deleting data, if you consider that this is destruction and therefore an attack, then, in my view, the, the concept of attack becomes over-inclusive. And this is also dangerous. So there, I think there's a real problem, and I agree with you, drones, there's really no new problem, at least in law with drones. How they are used, yes, transparency, for instance, but not the technology. Thank you. So that, that means there is an important distinction to be made between the permissibility, the acceptability of the technology as such, and the, the acceptability or legality of the way it's being used. Obviously, any weapon can be used unlawfully, from a wooden club to an autonomous weapon system. But there's only few weapon systems that can never be used lawfully, those that have been completely prohibited. But still, I sense that there is some kind of a bottom line agreement that the existing law is relevant, it does apply, and if the new technology cannot be used in compliance with it, then to that extent, that technology would be unlawful. Can we then just turn the, the logic 180 degrees in the base basically say, well, okay, that means that if it can be used in compliance with existing law, then everything's okay. Um, no. Well, one of the problems I have in, in being a panel of lawyers is a belief in the law and that people will actually abide by it. Uh, and that's my big problem, really. Uh, when you talk about new technologies, you imagine that if you have an indiscriminate weapon, oh, the law's okay. Nobody will, nobody will use it, nobody will, well, it, can't, it can't handle proportionality, it can't conform to the principle of distinction, therefore we'll all be very good and we won't use it. Just like we didn't use air power in any kind of bad way at all throughout history. Um, when we know how, we have no special laws for air power, but I don't think that worked out too well actually, to be honest. Today, yes, I know, but look at but look at the phase we had to go through to get there. So we don't really we don't really so so if you're talking about a treaty ban, the one thing that that does is it, it sharpens the focus on a particular technology, and makes creates a stigma for its use. So so that would be one way of doing it. But but could I just address the cyber issue for a moment because I don't want to get caught up too much in autonomy here. Um, because we could argue, we'll get into big, too big an argument. But I want to ask the law thing about this is, there are things about cyber that um, I've heard the military talking about in the United States. And one of them is that because forensics is impossible, you might want to use probability. Who is most likely to have used it? 
and then attack them on that basis. I would like to know how that fits with the law. <laughs> Does that require something new? Uh, not to mention, well, I'll give you the other one, which is uh, in cyber warfare, nobody shows their colours. So in military terms, you always have to show your colours, I believe. Well, submarines are a bit different. Um, so, so, and also, who's responsible for the separation of the civilian and military infrastructure? Bill. Uh, I, oh, wh sorry. where do you think that, or how does, what are the legal problems here? I sense a little bit it's a bit too simple. If these technologies can respect existing law, then we're fine. Uh, isn't there aspects, or aren't there aspects where the law doesn't quite fit these new technologies, or where we have to change the way we perform our obligations under international law because of the specific characteristics of these of these technologies. Uh, Bill, could you, could, you, could you speak to that? I agree with what's been said, that um, the existing law applies just as much to new technologies as it applies to old technologies. And the basis of that is the terms in which all states are required legally to review new weapons. And they're required to review new weapons by reference explicitly to existing international law norms. And there are a pretty standard set of legal criteria that you apply, uh, consisting of the superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering principle that's already been mentioned, the indiscriminate um, weapons prohibition that's already been mentioned, um, the environmental protection rules um, that haven't been mentioned, and any ad hoc weapon-specific rules that apply clearly to the particular weapon type that you're considering. The new technologies do sort of change that a bit in the sense that if you're talking about drone-type technology, if you're talking about cyber-type weapon systems, if you're talking about highly automated or autonomous weapon systems, it seems to me that you've also got to consider whether those weapon systems facilitate or at least enable the existing law relating to targeting to be applied. That's not something that you need to consider when you're reviewing a rifle, because self-evidently the existing law applies to the user of the rifle. But the minute that you're creating a technology which masks the, uh, the existence, as it were, of a user in terms of a human user when it comes to the decision to um, attack, then I think what one needs to satisfy oneself of is that that particular technology is capable of being used consistently with uh, the uh, targeting principles. I won't go through each of those principles and to the, the extent to which they may cause challenges uh, in relation to particular technologies because we'd be here all night and you don't want that any more than I do. Then I ask myself, right, well, okay, let's start thinking about particular technologies. What about performance enhancing technologies? Do they require legal review? Well, it seems to me, yes, they do because they would count as a method of warfare, which is specifically mentioned under Article 36. But what are the tests? How would you evaluate such a, a, a weapon system, given that there is no, it seems to me, ad hoc law, and given that the other customary principles that I mentioned manifestly don't seem to apply? And I think in practice, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be applying notions of domestic law. I think you're going to be asking whether the health and welfare of the individual, who by definition is going to be a member of your own armed forces, is adequately safeguarded by the way in which that technology is being applied to him or her. And then maybe there are ethical as well as legal worries to consider. What about nanotechnology? Well, I don't think that nanotechnology as such is going to be the subject of a weapons review. What I think in practice is going to happen is that uh, a weapons reviewer, a state thinking of acquiring a new weapon, is going to be confronted with a, an element of that weapon 
having been constructed using nanotechnology, and it's going to have to apply the standard rules, and it's going to need to satisfy itself that this particular uh, weapon, including the nanotechnological bit, isn't going to cause superfluous injury, isn't going to be indiscriminate, isn't going to uh, breach ad hoc uh, weapons-related law, and isn't going to have the prohibited effects on the natural environment. What about the obligation to review new cyber methods? It seems to me that the law applies to them in just the same way as it applies to any other weapon. Can it be used discriminately? You're not going to be so worried about the uh, effect on an adversary because that's going to be the weapon that's deployed as opposed to the cyber capability that you're employing to deliver that uh, injuring effect. And then what about the obligations of individual states to review an adequate... Uh, the question is whether their obligation to review new weapons is a satisfactory safeguard against unsatisfactory new technologies being brought into the battle space. Are we being adequately protected by this weapons review process? And the worry there is, firstly, that so many states are not known to have a satisfactory system for legally reviewing new weapons. And that, I think, is something that the international community would do well to address, and urgently. And then the second issue is confidentiality. States are going to be very disinclined to tell anybody about the opportunities that they perceive new weapons they're thinking of acquiring are going to afford them, and about the risks that they think that those new weapons may suffer in relation to technologies in the hands of others. So therefore, by definition, I think, this is an activity, this reviewing of weapons, if you like, that states are going to wish to continue to undertake themselves, however imperfectly, and in confidence. But on the other hand, can the law keep up? That's the question that's underpinning much of this discussion. Are future technologies adequately constrained, adequately limited by the rules that I've mentioned, superfluous injury and all the rest? Mostly, I think, the answer is yes. But absolute autonomy, um, human performance enhancers, human performance degraders, genetic weaponry, that sort of technology, I think, is a considerable worry. Partly because we don't somehow know what is going on in the research field, if you like, underneath our personal radars. Partly because we have a suspicion that in order adequately to address that sort of evolving capability, there is a new for, uh, need for new rules. But on the other hand, we're not terribly sure what new rules because we don't really know what the new technology is going to look like. And we have a suspicion that only when we know what the new technology is going to look like are we going to be in a position to draft new rules that are going to make sense. So is a blanket ban the answer? I suspect the answer is no. And I really think that a blanket ban of certain new technologies would be ignored, particularly by states that identify those technologies as affording them an opportunity. I think it's better, in my view, to promote wider engagement between states at the official level through whether it's the Conventional Weapons Convention process or the UN or whichever medium is thought to be uh, most appropriate to facilitate legal discussion about emerging technologies and with a view to developing a common sort of view about what the challenges are, how to interpret the application of law to these technologies and so on. Maybe that's a bit of an idealistic proposal from somebody who isn't normally noted for being an idealist. But it seems to me that um, some sort of discussion between states would start off on the basis of mutual suspicion. But the idea would be to erode that degree of suspicion and to get to a position where states feel the confidence to talk to one another and perhaps through that medium we get some sort of handle on what's going on under the bedclothes, if you'll excuse the analogy. And with that slightly better understanding of what's happening, we might feel a little less worried 
about the future, or maybe more worried, I don't know, than we are at the moment. But at least we would feel that the discussions were beginning the process of addressing the potential problems. I see we already kind of are drawn into the, the big question of the way forward, how, how to actually respond to, to, to the introduction and development of these, of these technologies. I just wanted to answer to Noel that we, the lawyers, we believe that the law will be respected. Yes, that's another issue, that we have to have implementation mechanisms, enforcement mechanisms, and states do not accept efficient enforcement mechanisms. But under this argument, you should also prohibit arms export, because indeed, and Switzerland has just liberalized its arms export to adapt it to the EU standards, which are even more liberal. And there, we know that these weapons are not used in conformity with IHL. So I would simply say, let, it, let us not discriminate against new technologies which, in historical uh, experience, nevertheless permit, for instance, in the field of targeting, more precise targeting. I mean, think about the aerial bombardments during the Second World War and the Vietnam War and compare them with today's aerial bombardments. There is, however, there is an issue we have to speak about, which is that once a technology exists and the state and their military consider that it is a very useful technology, there is a risk that the state practice which influences the law uh, will change and suddenly something which we would today say is unlawful is considered as lawful. So this is why I think the review process has perhaps to be rethought with these technologies that you constantly accompany a development. Because today, for instance, you cannot yet evaluate autonomous weapons because they don't exist. But that somehow the review process should constantly accompany a development and each, at each stage somehow to check, OK, what does that mean in terms of the possibility to respect the law? And the third issue, and here we could uh, nearly have the evening, there are some technical issues where indeed we have to agree on a new interpretation of the existing law. To give you an example which will not be controversial, I could give some controversial ones. Under the existing law, you can only commit a war crime during a war. And in peacetime, you cannot commit a war crime. Now, if the last human being programming a weapon which will then be used in wartime by a commander, but the commander doesn't, uh, the commander trusts that the weapon was correctly uh, programmed to attack only combatants and not civilians, and that it, the weapon is able to recognize those who are wounded and those who surrender and all these things, which apparently are not yet possible today. Uh, they, and the programmer deliberately misprograms, he cannot commit a war crime. I assume it's not a lady, it's a man, therefore I say he. And do, but there are solutions for that. We don't need a new treaty, but we have to agree on an interpretation. Or for instance, you have to interrupt an attack when it becomes apparent that the attack is lawful. I think this rule can perfectly uh, apply to drones, but even to autonomous weapons. But you cannot say when it becomes apparent to the machine that it is unlawful, because the machine is constructed by hypothesis that it doesn't become apparent to the machine. And you cannot either say that it's apparent for an autonomous weapon to the human being who has constructed the machine, because it doesn't become apparent. And therefore, but I think this is reasonable interpretation of existing rule, this means that the machine has to be constructed in a way that it becomes apparent to the machine. So the obligation, which is an obligation of the human being, to interrupt the attack when it becomes apparent to the human being, uh, has to be interpreted as meaning that if human beings use machines, they must be, make sure that the machines are able that it becomes apparent to them that an attack is unlawful as well as it would to a human being. Noel, you, did you want to respond to that? 
a little bit into all of that. I, I agree with you. I mean, one thing you said that I agree with anyway <laughs> was the idea that uh, states eventually accept a change because the big thing is about there are great fiscal cuts at the moment. We know that militaries are being cut all over the place and so the, the big, th big idea is to have force multiplication by using machinery and you put massive investment into that. But supposing you put massive billions, all your investment into autonomous weapons and at the end of it, they can't discriminate and they can't do proportionality. What do you do then? You get attacked. You've got, no other, you've got nothing else to defend yourself with. What do you do? So that was your point about the, the states changing the law. And I think that's one of the real problems. But also, I think, it's, I think it's not wise to think about this in terms of a single weapon. You know, you have a weapons review. It's a, it's a sort of war review you need. Because once you start getting more and more into automation, you start getting into this whole idea of a factory of war where we just automate war completely and there's no one, no one on our side being killed, then you might be totally discriminate, but your enemies might be very, very large. You might be discriminate in many, many countries, only killing their combatants. But is the war legal in the first place? And what's the nature of war? It could be so easy to go to war. So those are the sort of questions that you need to ask. I mean, so, so just being discriminate or being proportionate is insufficient to stop expansion of warfare and the illegality of, of, of wars. But uh, Laurent, do you see in, in, in any this danger of maybe a creeping change in state practice in order to reinterpret, or I wouldn't like to say twist the law, in order to accommodate the new technology? Or see, do, you, do you see this danger as being a real danger that over, over the long term this could actually lead to a, 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 a weakening of the protections that have been developed in the last century or so? Probably that would need a historical analysis to see how practice of state have indeed changed the law or not. But probably, I, I, I wouldn't say the risk do not exist and dismiss the risk. I think it's something certainly important. But I think we have to look at it both ways. And as uh, uh, Marco was mentioning, that some new technology have helped be having weapons more precise. One could wonder whether the standards in terms of precision of weapons have not evolved as well in the positive sense compared to a, a few decades or a century ago. And what would be today considered as indiscriminate might possibly not have been considered so uh, uh, at the time despite the fact that it's the same rule, so it's through uh, state practice interpretation. So I, I think it's in, uh, important, but in both aspects, both in the uh, risk of um, having a more relaxed interpretation, and uh, but also possibly having, uh, with uh, the development of uh, uh, new technologies, um, I mean, the push to you, I mean, the, there is anyway an obligation to use, whenever it's feasible, the most um, discriminate technology. I mean, the means and method of warfare, uh, uh, which will lead to, uh, uh, which will avoid or minimize civilian casualties. So that's um, uh, anyway already in the existing law. So anything which can be developed in that regard uh, uh, should at least uh, uh, theoretically bring to uh, diminution of civilian casualties if technologies exist. Now, to come back on another point that Niels, you had mentioned before, I didn't want to give the impression in my first presentation, I mean, the, the first time I talked, uh, uh, that uh, the ICRC think there is no need to develop the law. I think at this stage, with regard to the technology we are talking about, we don't have yet sufficient knowledge in terms of the technical feature uh, of those systems and their humanitarian consequences to have a position on whether or not the law would need to be developed. But throughout the history of IHL, uh, the ICRC has been at the forefront in terms of developing the law for specific weapons, etc. And we don't say we will not do that uh, in the future for those existing technology, just for the time being, not enough is known about that for us to take a position in that regard. We've talked about the law and, and it's maybe sufficient or insufficient precision and, and, and adequacy to, to, to regulate these things. But one issue that always comes up or very often with, with various uh, new technologies, cyber, the attributability of cyber attacks that you've mentioned that's very difficult, uh, but also um, 
with regard to autonomous systems is the question of responsibility. Yeah? If you have a system that basically decides what it will do autonomously, uh, who is responsible if it, if it causes damage, if it causes harm, if it does something that is unlawful? And I, I don't know, Roberta, would you like to kind of speak to this briefly? Yeah, so you leave me with the tough questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure that it might not be a she, the one planning the systems, by the way. We can be as nasty as men sometimes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the issue of responsibility is one of the big ones, and I think this is uh, also the reason why um, Professor Sharkey is so much concerned about automated we weapon systems and autonomous weapon systems. Human Rights Watch has been so much concerned about uh, the issue of targeted killings. And also, this is the reason why governments are very much concerned about the use of ne these new technologies. And there's a big endeavor in looking at the problem comprehensively. So looking at not just legal questions, but also the ethical questions. Because um, I think uh, the law is, is really strictly related to ethics and to moral questions. And um, just a little remark. I don't think that lawyers think that everybody will stick to the laws. I think laws are there to put some limits so that if someone breaches them, there's a way to, to look for redress. And this is why we have war crime provisions, we have international tribunals, and we have different legal paradigms. So in order to answer your question, um, for instance, if I look at the concerns of governments uh, or organizations like NATO, is that uh, you have different legal regimes, you have issues uh, related to insurance questions, protection of the environment by the use of such machines, the problem of um, um, product liability in case of malfunctioning, uh, the issue of individual criminal responsibility, which is not to be confused with command responsibility, and uh, for the governments, the states, one of the major issues is state responsibility. Um, can we attribute responsibility to states for the malfunctioning of a machine, of a drone, of an autonomous system? Can we attribute responsibility um, if a member of governmental armed forces does something unlawful? And this is where I think that scientists and engineers really need to talk very often to lawyers because this is another problem um, that we, we talk in compartments. And sometimes lawyers are not aware of the issues, the possibilities that are there in technology, and vice versa. This is maybe um, another particular aspect of new technologies, is that because of their technicality and difficulties, it's even more necessary that lawyers and um, those looking at the ethical aspects and engineers look at this problem. So to come back to really state responsibility, again here uh, there's been much concern, but um, fortunately, the articles on the attribution of responsibility to states for international wrongful acts have been adopted. I mean, the, the articles that were proposed by the International Law Commission. And one of the key principles is that any activity of a state's armed forces can be attributed to the state, regardless of whether the member of the armed forces was performing um, this act in its official capacity or unofficial capacity. And because we've seen that somewhere in the chain there's always a human being operating uh, or deploying the, the machine or programming it, there's always going to be the possibility to come back to a person acting on behalf of the state. So if it's a member of the state's armed forces, it's even easier. If it's not a member of the armed forces, um, forces, we have rules on, uh, on the fact that state agents always lead to attribution to the state for its acts. And we also have various limitations to the, to the use of um, defense arguments like uh, force majeure, vis major. So for, for instance, a state could not claim not to be responsible for the malfunctioning of a system in case of recklessness of negligence because I've seen uh, with the presentation of Mr. Busby, there's a review process that needs to be undertaken. Uh, weapons need to be tested. So a state can't, can't come um, with the argument that, oh, sorry, we didn't, we didn't foresee this kind of possibility, this kind of effect of the weapons. So again, thankfully, we have the Article 36 of Protocol 1. Another important aspect of state responsibility is that we're not looking at who is guilty. It's about 
who, to whom to attribute responsibility. And also in this case, even if a state could come up with a good argument in defense of, of the reason why it, it, it had to breach the rules, this has nothing to do with compensation. So if we have uh, victims, the state representing the victims can ask for compensation. So um, this is um, something that should tranquilize a little bit <laughs> those concerns. And again, the law should look, be looked at comprehensively. So again, we have criminal law for individual perpetrators. We have civil um, claims that can be filed. So different thank, possibilities. Thank you, Roberta. I think it's, it, that, that's a very important observation that I even though some of these new technologies may lead to difficulties in attributing, for example, criminal responsibility, because you may have a robot deciding something and it will be difficult to basically track the, a person that actually intentionally wanted that kind of unlawful result. It does not mean that no one's responsible. The state employing and using the, the system will be responsible legally, internationally, um, for the harm caused by that system and also uh, liable to, to, to pay compensation for harm caused. Um, how to enforce international law in the end is difficult, but that's a wider subject, as we know. That's not linked to new technologies in the first place. And also, the difficulties of, of attributing certain, certain operations in cyberspace, for example, to a certain state is, is not a legal difficulty or a legal problem that you could reasonably resolve with presumptions in these types of things, but it's a technical problem that has to be solved on that, on that level and it shouldn't be uh, uh, identified as a, a failure in the law if, if that becomes difficult. Because I think one thing I'd like to, to do before I just open to, the, to, to also to the audience to, to contribute to the discussion is just to have, but please, short statements because I think that would also generate discussion and I, I really would like to benefit also from, from the numerous uh, guests that we have here. And, and their expertise and, and their opinions and views um, as to the way forward. Where should, how, how should we deal with this? I mean, we, we've had you know, the, the issue of the ban, and, and I'm sure you know, would, would like to speak to that as well, but also the question of, of, of and how, uh, instead of the ban perhaps having, a ban of certain technologies, having uh, a dialogue initiated. Uh, my dream uh, wish for this would be that, well, Article 36 that keeps getting mentioned here is the idea that you review your weapons. But of course, no one knows how anyone reviews the weapons. There's no real rules about exactly how you review it. And one nation may have autonomous weapons and be perfectly capable of doing massive testing. Another nation may not. So my, my view, of my dream would be that the way forward would be that Article th uh, people's weapons reviews should be totally transparent to everyone else. That's what I would like to see. That would be a great way forward for me. And I'd like to know exactly how they were tested, in what, in the same way that we take medicine and we do drugs trials. And those drugs trials, well, I mean, drugs companies are a bit slimy, so they don't really, you know, they're not, you can't rely on them too much. But it's a lot better than the weapons reviews. At least there's some, you can, once there's a sort of pretended transparency, at least you can attack that and say, well, we want more, we want to know this issue, and we can question it. I think it would be excellent if all weapons review would be transparent. Uh, now, maybe a midway, which is, uh, I don't know if it's achievable, but um, at least that's a less unrealistic dream, I think, because dreaming that states would reveal all their technical uh, uh, expertise on new technologies, maybe uh, that's not foreseeable, but that at least when they make uh, review and they conclude negatively that the weapon is not allowed, that this conclusion is made public and the reason why. Because anyway, if that's the conclusion, uh, uh, the state will not be able to use that technology. That's its own conclusion. And that will also inform other states' opinion. And to come back to a point which has been done before, maybe prevent that state practice leads to uh, um, uh, the establishment of more relaxed practice by establishing that, no, this is forbidden. And probably, uh, you can certainly draw obligation, I don't know, but at least a responsibility to do that based on a uh, common article one from the Geneva Convention, which says that you have to ensure respect. And then for developer of technologies, for states who develop such technologies, uh, 
not only when they say that it's, um, the technology does not pass the uh, test of the law, but also when they put constraint on it, because uh, the law says that you have to review whether it can be used in all circumstances or in some circumstances. So that means that possibly the review will lead to the fact that you can use it in some and you cannot use it in other. And that this also, the aspect that it cannot be used in those circumstances is made public because, and that's all the more important because that weapon will possibly go under development and being used by that state, but only, at least hopefully, only under uh, the circumstances that it had considered lawful. Now, it might also sell that technology uh, uh, to other states, and those other states need to be aware of the fact that the one who developed that technology considered that in some circumstances that technology cannot be used. So I think at l I would say I have a, a, a half the dream of, but maybe a more realistic one than, uh, than you know, but certainly uh, the fact that uh, weapons review is central to the development of new technology, that's something I think most of the panel agree, and I think uh, certainly that uh, we at the ACRC agree. Just one other point is we mentioned compliance, and uh, I agree with uh, Niels that uh, uh, this is another debate, but also that this is extremely important and as we had mentioned that several times uh, uh, there is uh, that's also something we are working a lot on with uh, the swiss government on monitoring compliance for, for ihl but uh, as uh, uh, niels has mentioned that would open up an entire other debate so i'll stop here you just said dreams don't have to re be uh, realistic um i like to be more realistic than a dreamer because i learned that for instance um with too many ideals it's very difficult to, to keep up the struggle. And also in terms of IHL, I notice that sometimes uh, we expect from soldiers to be empathetic towards the enemy. We're not, not even empathetic toward their own comrades. So um, what I, I like to say is that maybe we should try to um, reestablish the, the correct scenario for the use of armed forces and to distinguish law enforcement operations from pure armed conflict scenarios, so that it would be also a little bit more easier for the lawyers to decide which rules of engagement to apply and how to train combatants, so that combatants don't have to operate as policemen, uh, because this is creating a lot of confusion in, in, in their heads. And um, in this sense, I think that, for instance, a lot of governments, including NATO, are undertaking a major effort. There's a current project that you're aware of. It's called, um, there's an international forum called MCDC, which is the Multinational Capabilities Development Concept. It's a forum which is open to all kinds of governments, institutions, academics. It was launched by uh, the US um, many years ago, and every two years they come up with a new research topic. and. Last year, one of the partners of this forum, which is NATO, launched a project to study um, the implications of the use of autonomous systems in gaining operational access. And some of us are in this project. We have lawyers, we have scientists, we have people looking at the ethical aspects, and the aim is to come up with policy guidelines. Um, obviously, it will be down to states to decide whether to follow these guidelines, but I think that the effort is worth it, so we're actually doing something about it. And um, I think it's very important to encourage this kind of discourse. And my hope is that when we have different projects on different important research topics that we don't think about our own little agendas, but that we try to exchange views and cooperate and think about it globally so that not everybody is conducting its own study in its own little corner. So this is why I'm very glad that we're here to exchange views. Thank you very much, Roberta. Uh, also, so we, we had the idea of sharing information about weapons reviews, sharing some information about weapons reviews, policy guidance, uh, other ways forward briefly. Marco? First of all, my dream is the dream of the UN Charter. <laughs> prohibition of the use of force and respect of human rights. But we are here dealing with humanitarian law, which applies to armed conflicts. And there we have, indeed, to be realistic. And technology has advantages in armed conflicts. And even outside armed conflicts, at least my car, perhaps because it's a German car, makes less mistakes than I do. 
And therefore, you cannot say a machine makes more mistakes than a soldier, because soldiers are not very reliable people, us all human beings. Obviously, technology must remain controlled by human beings, but this doesn't mean that the human being has all the time be, be, to be behind it. States must take IHL into account when they develop new technologies. I think it is justified that civil society NGOs ask legal and ethical questions, but simply don't be biased against technology. Ask the same questions about missiles, about aircraft, about rifles. That's, I think, important. Transparency, indeed, this is my dream, because it's not a rule of humanitarian law, unfortunately. While human rights law has very important rules on transparency, and as human rights uh, are also applicable in armed conflict, this may help, but uh, this is, yes, something new that states should be more transparent, and I think public opinion can have uh, an impact not only on the weapons review, but also on how they use it and why it didn't work or why it worked. Finally, while I'm against a ban, perhaps I'm even more dangerous for these new technologies than those who ask for a ban, because I simply ask that those new technologies may only be used if uh, IHL is respected by the human beings who use those technologies. I agree with Marco completely. I think the answer is legal compliance. Absolutely. Where bans are concerned, um, I would be very, very skeptical about a call for a ban of a technology that doesn't also call for a ban of the uh, weapon systems that the technology in question is being developed to address. It's very easy to call for a ban of an autonomous or automated technology that is being used to try to be the last line of defence against a mass inbound rocket attack, for instance. If you're not going to also ban massed inbound rocket attacks, what state is going to, that is seriously threatened by that sort of capability is going to go along with you and say, oh yes, yes, we'll ban the only way that we can address this threat against us? Not many, certainly not many sensible states. I think the problem in making weapons reviews publicly available is that if you do that, there are going to be even fewer weapons reviews undertaken than at present, and heaven only knows there are too few in practice undertaken at present, I believe. Why? Because a properly undertaken weapon review will tell you exactly how to counter the weapon concerned. No state has an interest in doing that. I'm sorry, it is a dream. And I'm sorry, I ain't no dreamer. <laughs> but on the other hand, I then address myself to the states that take the chance, that don't actually undertake weapons reviews. Increasingly in this world, I think you're taking an enormous chance because lawyers, sooner or later, are going to latch on to the fact that if a situation arises where proper tests, had they been done to inform a weapons review, would have identified the thing that went wrong that caused their client to be killed, injured, have their home destroyed, or something of that nature, you can expect some sort of legal consequence. It's outside the scope of this discussion exactly what form it might take. I just indicate to you that you're taking a risk. And as time goes by, in my judgment, you're taking an ever greater risk. And I think it's time that states woke up to this obligation, which over 170 of them have signed up to. And then, yes, I've advocated consultation. I've advocated 
a process of growing confidence amongst states. And I've suggested that the CCW process might be a venue for that. It will be up to states to decide what the correct venue would be, what format it might take, and how they might go about developing this sort of confidence. And I don't think it will be easy, and I don't think it would happen overnight. But I do think it would provide states with the opportunity to discuss amongst one another emerging technologies and their concerns and their thoughts. I'm not suggesting it will be the venue for new law or treaties and things of that nature, most certainly not. But what it might well be is a process that could lead to lesser understandings and perhaps an approach to dealing with new technology and an understanding of how the existing law applies to it, which otherwise might become rather fragmented. And I'm not sure that it's in the interests of the global community that understandings in this area should be fragmented. Thank you.